coming up, an interview with my mother, Cynthia Redman. A mother's journey. Only on Matters of the Heart. Trust me, you do not want to miss this. Stay tuned. What's up, everyone? You're listening to JBCM Radio. You can learn more about us at jbcmradio.com. We are here expanding the appreciation of creativity in all forms. Hey, friends. This is John Redmond, and guess what? Matters of the Heart Radio Show is now on Facebook. Yes, post your comments, share your pictures, like us, or even contact us, because you know what? We want to hear what you have to say. This is Linda Pearl, and I hope you, like me, keep listening to JBCM Radio. It's so easy to say I love you, but somehow your affection sends me on an international pilgrimage of love, a journey that allows me to love you in Swahili, in love you. French, je t'aime, Spanish, te amo, German, ich liebe dich, Italian, te amo, Swedish, ja eskate, Russian, ja lublu te bien, Chinese, vous ani, Irish, and oh yes, Greek. Matters of the Heart family and friends, y'all, thanks so much for tuning in to this show and this episode. I am your host, John Redman. And you guys, my mom, Cynthia Redman, is in the house. She is going to be giving her world famous testimony on a mother's journey. But before we get started with her, let's set this episode off with my girls, Full Assurance, from Orlando, Florida, singing the hit, Praise the Lord, right here on Matters of the Heart. Great things he had taught us, great things he had done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin.
matters of the heart listening audience, on the phone right now is my mother, my heart, uh, Miss Cynthia Redmond. Mom, can you say hello to the matters of the heart friends and family out there? Hello, everyone. I'm so excited. We've been looking forward to today, this time with John and you. It's so great to have you on the show, Mom. And now I'm sure y'all out there are saying, now, why is John having his mom on the show? Well, all throughout our lives, me and my two sisters, Esther and Mary, we've been um, hearing from everyone we, who met our mother or watched us grow up, what an amazing mom we had. She was always revered as a superb Christian parent from so many people in various walks of life. So I asked her to share some of her story and some of her secrets of parenting today. So what we're going to do before we even get started with her, we're going to jump into her testimony that um, you've recorded, Mom, on the album A Woman's Journey back there in 2001 called A Mother's right. Journey. A Mother's Journey was actually um, recorded on the same record with Vicki Winans and Brenda Nicholas and, 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 and Ellen Cherry. And after we listen to the testimony, we're going to just kind of dissect the testimony and then do a fast forward to your current journey in 2016. Okay. So exactly. everybody, we're about to do A Mother's Journey recorded back by my mother, Cynthia Redmond, back on the Woman's Journey CD um, released back in 2001. Let's give a listen. Sitting in a wheelchair, waiting my turn to be x-rayed, I sat tearfully praying, Lord, please give me the strength to raise my babies. It was May 1975. John Redman and his fraternal twin sister Esther had just been born. Almost two-year-old sister Mary was at home with grandmother Roberta. Mother Cynthia May Redmond's journey had just taken turn up a steep incline. A journey, however, that I would not make alone. The Lord's promises flashed through my mind as the thought of my failed marriage pierced me. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Isaiah 54, verse 5. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, verse 5. I can recall... How I chose to remain at home with my babies rather than immediately return to the office. How hurt I felt when someone pointed out the second-hand clothing my children sometimes wore. We painfully endured how some took advantage of our obvious poverty, approaching with their so-called help, while their hidden agenda was to probe into our personal affairs and spread that information abroad. Gratefully, though, there was a brighter side. How in strong support, my mother, sisters, Mother-in-law, other family members and friends helped me with the care of my children. How God sent a kind lady neighbor who became our family benefactor. And when the children were small, before we owned our first car, how dear friends gave us rides to church and special events. How a church brother maintained our used car while accepting small monthly payments for his services. How there were true Christians who remembered the family for birthdays, Christmas, and other special occasions. How my youngest sister and a dear foster mother stepped in and cared for my children when I desperately needed a break. And how the Lord brought into our lives a wonderful woman psychiatrist to help me over the rough spots. I didn't abuse the help of others. I heeded my mother's advice to sit on that nest as well as counsel from the Word of God. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, verse 6. I've never regretted my obedience. It was Christmas time. Oh, about 1992. I was alone with God in my thoughts, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Do you remember your prayer after the twins were born as you sat waiting to be x-rayed? Remember you asked for strength to raise your three children? I said, yes, Lord. The Holy Spirit continued, I answered that prayer. My mind flashed back over time to that x-ray scene, and the tears began to flow. Mary had graduated from Golden Gate Academy, and twins John and Esther were in the 11th grade. Oh, how my pen quickly flew over many Christmas cards, sharing this revelation with family and friends of how God had reminded me of this answered prayer. What voices do the single mother hear? The voice to her ego. 
You need to make something of yourself. You'll grow old and never accomplish anything in life. The voice of the tempter. You are lonely. My arms are waiting for you. Come on over. But there was also the voice of God. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Fear thou not, Cynthia May Redmond, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, verse 10. I listened to the voice of God and ignored the rest, and I've never regretted that decision. God's voice echoes that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. Psalm 144, verse 12. Today the children are all grown, and I'm even a grandma. Beautiful young grandson, Yaku, is my heart. For the most part, my home is quiet, the nest empty. What now? I realize that I should not make the mistake of clinging to my adult children. They must be released into God's service. It's time for my voice to decrease while the voice of God increases in their lives. Is my journey ended? Oh, no. What does the Holy Spirit direct that I do now? I must share the spiritual wisdom of the past journey. Through my life and testimony, it is my delight to share my Lord and best friend with others. Since April 1990, I've been involved with Touch of Love Ministries. It's been a rewarding experience bringing hope to inmates behind bars. Finally, when the journey is over, the obedient will hear heaven's well done. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Proverbs 31, verse 29. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. What he did for me, he can do for you. So be encouraged, friends. Have your talk with the Lord. Yes, tell Jesus. Jesus can help you. Jesus alone. Wow, Mom, what an amazing and inspirational testimonial. Every time I listen to that, A Mother's Journey, it's like brand new to me and it takes me back, you know, with you. So... For our listening audience, can you go on and tell us again how many children you have and grandchildren you have and and who exactly are you? Okay, three children, three adult children. My oldest daughter is Mary, and she has husband and four children, four grandchildren by Mary. Then my second pregnancy, I had twins, John and his sister, Esther. And... Esther has an adult son, so I have five grandchildren all together. Wow, five. That's some kind of magical number. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. and so you're a grandmother right now. Oh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Been one uh, for 21 years now. My grandson is 21, and he's in his last year of college. Oh, that's so amazing. How time I'm flies. I'm so proud of him. Yes. So let's jump into your testimonial, because this is a mother's journey. We're going to talk about your experience as being a mother. On the initial part of your testimony on a mother's journey, you spoke of a failed marriage in your opening um, part of your testimonial. So let's talk about that for a moment. Can you tell us briefly about your marriage and why you deemed it as failed? Well, I wasn't planning on this one. (laughs) Um, uh, Well... I remember when I was a young woman and my thought was like, I'm not going to marry anybody who wasn't in the church. So my main thing was, you know, I wouldn't even consider anybody who wasn't in the church. So I didn't, I never dated outside the church. And so one day I was at church and in walks in this gentleman. And I thought, wow, he's so sweet and handsome and, who is that? You know, he really caught my eye. He was a stranger, but 
someone who really looked nice. And so somehow we connected, got my phone number, we started talking, and then history goes from there. It's like, and then one other thing too, a very short, uh, short-term relationship before we got married. It was about five months, which I would suggest that no one go that quickly because you don't really know something in five months. But anyway, so after five months of courtship, we tied the knot. And uh, we didn't have children right away. Uh, we waited. I was working, he was working. And so after a period of time, we decided we should start a family. And we did. I had Mary, and then Mary was a toddler, and I was thinking, oh, she shouldn't grow up by herself. We, she needs a sibling. And so I told my husband, we need another child to grow up with her. Well, little did I know that the Lord had other plans, not just one, but two. So it's like Mary, John, and Esther. And uh, I said, Lord, you know, just give me the strength. Well, what happened uh, just before John and Esther were born, um, the marriage fell apart. And I left. It's like, Lord, I can't, I can't put up with this. I've got to get out and get away from here. It sounds like you said that he appeared to be dangerous. Yes. Um, he had lost his job. Well, I wasn't working because I was home expecting very soon to deliver twins. And I was very, very heavy pregnant. John and Esther were mm-hmm. both over the regular baby's weight. So I was huge. And um, so I was home. And he was losing his job. Money was disappearing, didn't know what he was going to do, upset, and so I had to get away from him. Hmm. For my safety, the safety of my babies that weren't born yet. So let's talk about, let's talk to those women with children right now who are listening to you, who have to make a painful decision to either cling to their children versus their husband or boyfriend or whatever reason. What words of wisdom would you give? Well, I turned to God. I prayed. I said, Lord, when I realized it was a threat, I said, Lord, please deliver me. And I meant that. I remember being on the edge of my bed, so I went from him as I could, praying, Lord, please deliver me. And I remember the next morning, he was very calm. And uh, his statement was, he felt like it wasn't working. I was thinking, praise Jesus. And uh, my only concern was Mary, because I know he loved me. I said, well, what about Mary? And he said, well, Mary will stay with you. He said, a court would give her to you any day. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. So uh, he went to work. Dropped me off at my mother's house, went over there to do laundry. He dropped me off there. And my heart, which I never said to him, in my heart, I ain't coming back. And that's how I got away. So we, we know like a lot of, um, a lot of um, women usually say, I'm never going back and wind up going back and then leaving and going back. And you saying that you never, did you ever go back at all? No. The only thing I did, I took my sister with me, and I think we had the police on the lookout. And I knew he was at work. I came back to get my things. I grabbed my documents, things I knew I would need, and, and made a clean sweep while he was gone. That was it. Never looked back. So when you go back, if you go back to get your things, have somebody there with you. Get some help. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did, because uh, I didn't know if I would run into him or not. But just in case I did, I needed protection. And remember, I am heavy pregnant with John and Esther. So I'm moving like a snail. So I needed help. Huh. We're going to flip the script really quickly. So this is interesting. So your maiden name is 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 what? Ratliff. It's Ratliff. But you still uh-huh. go by... You still go by Redmond, your ex-husband's name. Why is that? That's right. Because all of my children have that last name. And we're a family. 
and I wanted to be identified with them. So that's why I did it. So interesting. For all Redmonds, there'd be no question that you belong to me. We're going to go to Vicki Winans, Can I Build My Home in You, right here on Matters of the Heart. You are listening to JBCM Radio. You can learn more about us at jbcmradio.com. Are you interested in being a sponsor or underwriter for this amazing show? Then call 719-299-0879. That's 719-299-0879 and ask for Jay. This is John Redman. Thank you all so much for staying tuned in. I have such a special guest on the other line. She's doing an interview for us. It's none other than my mother, our mother, Cynthia Redman, mom. Thank you so much for um, giving us your powerful testimony on being a mother in a mother's journey. It's a delight to be here today. I mean, it's just wonderful to be able to talk to my son and you at the same time. Great experience. (laughs) 
This is awesome. This is awesome. I'm learning so much even right now. So mom, let's talk about being a single parent, a single mother. And, and let's talk about a very um, controversial topic right now, um, daycare. What did you do in regard to daycare with your children? Did you choose to actually put them in daycare or, 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 or stay home? I had to make a decision. Um, I am an administrative assistant by trade, and so I know how to work, make money, but I have these three babies. So I said, let me discuss this with my mother. So I asked the mother, you know, what would you do? What should I do? And her counsel to me, which I'll never forget, was sit on that nest. So I obeyed. I thought she's right. So I stayed home. Didn't start work until my children were all in school. So how did you support yourself? ta -da! She took me to this particular place, and when it was time to come home, she told me, oh, uh, I won't be able to take you home. Are you interested in being a sponsor or underwriter for this amazing show? Then call 719-299-0879. That's 719-299-0879. And ask for Jay. Didn't start work until my children were all in school. So how did you support yourself? ta -da! Public assistance. <laughs> so we're talking about welfare. Yeah, we're talking about welfare. Wow, wow. Another hot topic. So uh, what did, was there a disdain or was there some shame that came with uh, being on welfare, especially with you, you know, being used to bringing in money and working? We didn't have a car. So I had... I, in fact, I couldn't even get on the bus with all my children when they were small because I didn't have enough arms to carry them. So we'd have to catch rides with people. So that was a problem because, you know, people would help you some, but they'd get tired after a while. So, you know, that was a problem. Um, people often would take advantage. Um, I had people, you know, hurt my feelings. Uh, I had one lady, which was really horrible. She offered me a ride. Now, I don't know if the children were with me that day. She offered me a ride to a certain place. No, I think I asked her for a ride, and she consented. She took me to this particular place, and when it was time to come home, she told me, oh, uh, I won't be able to take you home. You know, it, was, it was terrible. If you don't have your own car, you're depending upon someone else to help you. That was one of the examples of things that I went through. Now, you've talked about in your testimony um, a mother's journey. You talked about a foster mother and a sister stepping in when you desperately needed a break. And then you went on to talk about a psychiatrist. Oh, yeah. Well, John is getting into some very interesting areas. Um, yes, um, all of this had its emotional toll on me. And uh, there was a time when I didn't feel like I could hold it together. So my sisters, you know, I explain to them my dilemma, and uh, they would step in from time to time and, you know, would uh, assume the responsibility, and I would take a break. And there have been times when it got serious enough where I did need some psychiatric help, which I was thankful, and I believe the Lord was in that because although this particular psychiatrist, she was a woman, she didn't have the same faith as I had. I believe she was a Christian woman, and she did uh, give me some of the assistance I need during that time. That's awesome. So no shame in getting some professional help. I have a lot of friends no. who actually have so many issues. I mean, deep seated issues. And I know I've even had um, about three counselors in my adult life that I've actually sought professional help from um, about various issues. And so um, it's just interesting how people just are like, they turn or close the door or shut the door when you try to offer them some help by asking them to, you know, 
get some professional help for their issues. And a lot of people just say, no, I'm not going to have anybody else in my business or they'll turn, you know, they'll turn a deaf ear. But there is professional help out there for situations that we actually go through in our in our adult lives and our in our um, adolescent years. And and that's what they're there for. So I'm asking, you know, if you're listening right now to this radio station and you know that you have some issues going on that you just can't seem to shake. God is there. Absolutely. Absolutely. But sometimes right. you have to reach out and go to a professional counselor, even a Christian counselor, um, to actually help you work through your issues, because a lot of times they don't just disappear. And I think one way to look at that is if you had a physical problem, you know, a broken arm or heart problem or something else wrong with you physically, you wouldn't hesitate to go to a medical doctor. Well, you, right. the mind is also in need of help sometimes. You have problems with your emotions. And there are doctors out there who are qualified to assist you. And there's nothing wrong with seeking help. We'll be right back. Are you enjoying the music on today's Matter of the Heart show? All these tracks are found on the project A Woman's Journey. You can find it on iTunes, CD Baby, Amazon, just to name a few. It's Brenda Nicholas, Vicki Winans, Cynthia Redmond, Full Assurance, The Oakwood College Aeolians, A Woman's Journey. And we are interviewing and talking to my mom, your mom, Cynthia Redmond on A Mother's Journey. And she's giving us her her testimonial on how God has actually helped her raise her children. And and, and it's interesting, in your testimonial on A Mother's Journey, on the A Woman's Journey album, you went on to mention about a kind lady neighbor who became um, our family benefactor, quote unquote. Tell us how that happened. All right. Her name was Marjorie. Unfortunately, Marjorie, you know, has passed away. But when I first got married, we lived in an apartment building. And right next to our building, there was a house on the corner, an older model house. And there was a senior lady who lived there. And every morning when I went to work, I know this lady would be going to work, too. And it's like... We'd get on the same bus, and we would get off, and each day we kept bumping into each other. So it's like, okay, well, well, hi, what's your name? You know, and so from that seemingly unmeaningful encounter, we became friends. So we exchanged phone numbers, and from time to time we talk on the phone. And uh, over time, um, uh, one time I remember we got into a little financial difficulty. I think we needed some help paying the rent. And she stepped forward and helped us. And we remained in touch over the years. And even after I no longer was married uh, to the children's father, we stayed in touch. And she kept in touch with us. It was beautiful. And I remember um, one Thanksgiving, I invited her over, and she had Thanksgiving dinner with us. And I remember one Christmas, she came with a bag of things that she had wrapped. And this is like things from her kitchen, you know. But something for the children, children a little, something for them to unwrap. And it's like, sometimes it was like cake mix or whatever, but different packages that she had wrapped for them. And they had a wonderful time opening up these packages. And that was Aunt Marjorie. It was a beautiful experience. And she stayed in touch with us over the years. And so when it's like, when it came time for the children to go to school, of course, I didn't have much money. I shared with her my desire to send my children to church school because I didn't really want them in public schools. And Marjorie stepped up to the plate, and for years she wrote that check. I mean, not 100% of the financing, but I would estimate at least 90%. She funded 
all three of my children from grades 1 through 12 went to Golden Gate Academy Church School, graduated, and we didn't owe any money at the end. And I just thank God. So a neighbor that you kept in contact with all those years decided to step up and and send all three of your children through Christian education. And she pretty much, you said, um, foot 90% of the bill through 12 years of Christian education for each of your children. Oh, yeah, she did. And another interesting point, she used to go to church, but she was not current church attender. And she told me, she said, Cynthia, I did this because I wanted to. When she passed, it's like, oh, no, not Marjorie gone. She left word with her, I believe, her brother, no funeral. There was no way for us to go and say goodbye. And, and that hit me because it's like, I want to say goodbye. Mm-hmm. So what we did, I think I bought some flowers. She had been in um, like a retirement home before she died. And I used to go there and visit her. So what I did. I got some flowers, and I remember taking all the children with me, and I think I I wrote a card or something expressing how much this person had meant to my family, and we took it to the retirement home and left it there, the flowers and the card. That was my way of saying goodbye. I had to do something. You all, this is a real testimonial. This is this is something that is not made up. This is this is uh, a real testimony from uh, Miss Cynthia Redmond, my mom, and I can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that every aspect, every word she's saying is true because I'm a product of all this. And um, never underestimate the power of God. God had right. a, a, a kind lady neighbor who was not an avid churchgoer to pay for three little black kids because Marjorie was white. It was a white lady right. and had three little black kids footing the bill for their Christian education because their mother refused to take her children and put them in public education. That's right. <laughs> You all, thank you so much for staying tuned in um, to Matters of the Heart. I am John Redman, and yes, this is my mother. We are doing an interview with, and your mother as well, Cynthia Redman. You know, Esther hates sharing you. I just had to put that on blast, Mom. You know, all throughout, all throughout our young adult life or young uh, uh, adolescent life, everybody always wanted my mom to be their mom, and Esther was like, "Uh-uh, she's taken. Go get your own." <laughs> Esther, we just had to put you on blast. Anyway. <laughs> Mom, I didn't mind sharing you because I knew, you know, but everybody didn't have, have a, a Cynthia Redman in their life, but Esther had an issue. Now, Wendy Williams, a talk show host, um, has a part of her show called Hot Topics, but we're going to talk about a contemporary hot topic right now, which um, we are going to definitely address in this next section of this interview, and it's about discipline. So, Mom, a lot of times people try to attribute a biblical reference to the phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child, which is not even in the Bible. What the actual Bible verse says in Proverbs 13, 24, it says this, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Now, now that was an Old Testament book that spoke of discipline. What was your take on disciplining your children when you were raising them? I did not spare the rod. No, she didn't, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I admit it. I confess. <laughs> <laughs> I did not spare the rod. <laughs> no, she didn't. No, she didn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I did. And now I'm going to tell one on John. Oh, Lord. John was a toddler, and John had a bad temper. When things didn't go his way, he would just fall out on the floor, ranting and raving. I looked at that a little toddler acting like that. So I had a little switch. You know, it wasn't anything too big. It, it wasn't abuse now. A little switch. Got that switch. And every time he fell out, I tanned his legs until he got up. I said, oh, no, we're not going to have this. One day, he got ready to fall out, and he looked at me, and I said, don't you dare. We broke it up. No more falling out. And another thing, too. As far as you see these children, when you're in the stores, grocery stores and something, carrying on loud and parents can't control them, that never happened with John. 
we took care of that at home. Thank the Lord. Okay, so y'all, so y'all, uh, I, I'm gonna let y'all know I am healed. I have never done a tantrum <laughs> since then. It worked. It worked for me. Worked. <laughs> so, so uh, Mrs. Redmond, mother, yeah. at what age yeah. do you think it's a good idea to spank or whip your children? And what age do you think it's time to stop? Well, let me say this. First of all, that would not be your first thing to do. You talk with your children. You know, you tell them, no, no, when they're little. You try to encourage them to do the right thing by talking to them. Then, if that doesn't work, you have to reinforce it. It's best not to try to discipline your child if you're angry because you're going to overdo it and you might hurt them. While they're little, you work with them. But when they reach an age where you know they fully understand, I mean, you, reach, you know, when you're little, you're, you're guiding them. They don't understand always. When they reach an age of accountability, and especially after they get big, you can forget that. I remember I think one time I was whooping somebody in the belt with ricochet and hit me, and it was hurt. It's like, uh oh. Ha! I mean, oh. <laughs> Time to stop. <laughs> Let the record show she was not whipping me. It was probably Esther and Mary. They always needed whoopings. I was a I was a wonderful child after the tantrums. All and my three mom of them got it. it. Oh Lord, she putting my business on Front Street. Ooh, I'm going to have to cut this interview short. You're telling too much. No, I'm just kidding. This is wonderful. This is what we need to hear. In 2006, there was a comedy called Failure to Launch that starred Matthew McConaughey and Sarah Jessica Parker that was released in theaters I everywhere. It was, about a, it was about a 30-something still living at home until his parents yeah. hired an interventionist to help him graduate up out the house. So, Mom... Yeah. What do you say to those parents who can't get their children out of the house or to those parents who refuse to let their children grow up and out? Let me say this. When you are raising your children, are you giving them the tools for life as they're able to handle it? One thing that happened to me, the Lord pointed out to me, as we would get ready for church in preparation, I would go find all their shoes and line them up so that when it came time to go, you went looking for a shoe, you'd find your shoes. So that became a habit over the years. You know, I'm a single parent. Nobody is looking at me, watching me, telling me what I'm doing. You know, they, I was just doing it out of habit. Then one day, I guess the Lord spoke to me. Look at those shoes. They're almost as big as yours. Stop doing this. And it hit me. It's like, oh, okay. It was time to change. In other words, are you equipping your children at each stage of life with the tools that they need to live? Are you teaching them to tie their shoes or are you still tying them? Are you teaching them how to cook or do you always cook for them? Are they making their own bed? Are they doing their own laundry? So all along the line, you're equipping them. And then when they reach, say, 18 years old, if they want to watch out on their own, and when you're equipping them, that pretty much they want to. They realize there's a lot they can do, and they'll be ready to take off. But what if you don't do that? What if you still tying their shoes and still making their bed and still cooking all their food and everything, and then when they reach 18 years of old, you're ready to kick them out. It's like, uh-uh, scared to death. My children did not want to stay home. They were ready to go. No, 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 no. Mary and Esther wanted to go. John wanted to stay home with Mama forever, but Mama was like, oh, you done lost your mind. You got to become a grown man. So you're 17, so you, you can, you can you hit, pack your bags and go stay with your grandmother. Mama needs a break. I'm done. I'm through. He didn't, hey, he didn't like me after that. I don't think we talked for three years. <laughs> I was like, she don't love me no more. But baby, that was the best thing you could have ever done for me. Because telling, she was running around telling everybody I was. She, he had a horrible mama. She kicked me out the house. <laughs> Let the record show. I don't remember any of that. But honestly, if she's saying that I yes. did that, I probably did. I was hurt. Yeah, I was a mama's did. boy. I was a mama's yeah, boy. Yeah, he was. He was hurt. But I knew I needed a break. It's like okay, there. 
You have age. I need a break. And like I say, I didn't put him in the street. I didn't put any of my children in the street. They had some place. They had a roof over their heads away from me. She's been a wonderful role model um, of, a, of a spiritual parent and what honestly a template of what a Christian parent should be. And she never had anybody over us and abusing us or molesting us or had any boyfriends oh, no. over the house. She oh, always no. stood in the gap by herself. Honestly, um, I find no fault in Cynthia Redmond because she has been an absolute, she's been a godsend of a parent. And I am just, we are all so blessed to have her as mom. You recall the story of the footprints in the sand, where there were two sets of footprints in the sand, and then later on down on the beach, you saw only one set. And in my story, it's always been only one set of footprints, because God carried me the whole way. He realized I'm frail, and he carried me, and I give him all the honor and glory.
all are so patient with us, and we're just so glad that you all decided to stay tuned in to Matters of the Heart. I am your host, John Redman, and yes, we are interviewing my mother, um, Cynthia Redman, on her journey, a mother's journey, her Christian spiritual journey with God. And now she's not just a mother, but she's a grandmother. Mom, can you go on and tell us, and as we fast forward to present day, as we start to wrap up this interview, What's your journey look like in 2016? Mm, that's a good question. For the record, I'm 70 years old. I've made the promise. So you know my children are not young. Well, wow, hold on. Hold. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. Don't be trying to tell our age, though. I'm not okay. telling your age. Okay, go ahead. Math. <laughs> oh, Lord. Continue. All of my children are thriving. Thank God. And it's like, the way I feel, it's like I feel like I'm the eagle sitting on an empty nest. And as I'm sitting there, I'm viewing all my adult eagles now flying around. And they're all surviving beautifully. They're swooning around, doing different things, different missions, different paths. And they swoop into the nest to touch base with me from time to time. And we fellowship and off they go again. And that's how John is. John is all over the place. Um, she ain't lying. Excuse me. I had a recent experience. I want to share this with uh, my daughter, Esther. She said, Ma, you know, let me take you to lunch. I said, okay. So we arranged a date and time, and she picked me up, and off we went. So we were at this restaurant sitting opposite each other. And the time I had with her was so special. Fellowship, spiritual woman to spiritual woman. It wasn't mother to child. It was adult to adult, woman to woman. We confided. It was the most beautiful experience I've ever shared with another woman. And I came home just, I said, Lord, look at this. And I don't say that about Esther or John or Mary because I raised them. But it was just the most unique experience I have ever had. And I said, Lord, thank you. So it's like at this stage in life, I'm looking at my children, adult to adult. I don't tell them what to do. And as I shared that with John, he told me, Ma, we wouldn't let you tell us what to do. That's true. (laughs) I don't tell my children what to do. You know, even when they were growing up, it's like, what is it you want to do in life? And when they shared that with me, I tried to help them do that. I remember when John was little and I could see he was interested in in the keyboard. It's like, okay, I didn't know much about it, but what little I knew, I shared that much with him, and then he took that and ran with it, and then later we got professional lessons, and he has taken off with that today. So I've always tried to promote their interests, not project my interests onto them, the tremendous product that he has made possible in my children. John called me one day, and I think we talked about an hour and a half, and When we got off the phone, his comment was, Ma, I am so greatly encouraged. My heart soared. That is my place. Not to dip into my children's lives, but if I can be of some encouragement, support, emotional support, I'm here. And that's pretty much my role. It's beautiful. Fill in the blank, Mom. My greatest accomplishment is? My greatest accomplishment now? is my closeness to God. Beautiful. You all have heard it right here on Matters of the Heart. We've run out of time. Mom, I thank you so much for sharing us your heart and sharing your testimony with us and the Matters of the Heart family and friends out there. Would you like to say goodbye out there to to the family who is listening? Thank you so much, John. Goodbye, everybody. This has been a wonderful treat for me. I appreciate it. God bless all of you. Make sure you all tune in next week for our Matters of the Heart next episode. You will not want to miss that either. Take care and God bless. 